force uh, from, from uh, gas power to electric and maybe even to rates. And they were asking uh, if you could just describe how that might be incorporated into this kind of work, what that might look like. And then two, I was interested in, um, I noticed that in your uh, plan here, there'll be a presentation and some evaluation. And if you could just tell us some of the markers, the metrics you'll be using uh, to um, uh, just very briefly uh, to know how we'll know whether this program was successful. Thank you, uh, welcome. Dr. Shepard. Thank you. Uh, certainly, uh, to answer your, your first question, I think there's, uh, we laid out sort of five or six uh, categories of climate action. And sometimes these are things that people don't recognize as climate action, but they, they're an issue. And you mentioned leaf blowers as something that has issues around noise and air pollution sometimes and can be quite contentious. Um, but we think that, that those kinds of activities are actually a key part of it. And if we are uh, for example, switching to electric leaf blowers, then that's a kind of positive climate action that can still meet the needs, but reduce uh, the carbon emissions, as well as some of the health impacts and reduce the noise issues and things like that. So, so we think that's a, a, a good example of, a, uh, of an action, um, but it definitely has a climate impact. Um, there's also a, an aspect of, uh, the kind of landscapes, uh, whether it's private yards or boulevards um, that people uh, design and manage and use, um, some of them require a lot of uh, maintenance. Leaf blowing is an example of that. Others that are used more natural materials or less lawn, for example, um, can reduce that as well. So there are multiple ways to meet those uh, adaptation and mitigation objectives um, around the kind of you know, landscape maintenance. We know we know Oak Bay loves its beautiful landscape as we all do, and uh, but there are there are better ways and, and worse ways to manage that. And uh, and I think you've raised one that uh, uh, that we should certainly look at closely. Uh, the second question, if I may, um, is an important one as well uh, in terms of evaluation metrics. Um, so typically. Uh, what we would be thinking of here is to sort of measure, if you like, the, the level of interest, the level of excitement that uh, community groups have, um, you know, how many people apply, how many people express interest, that's, that's very early on. Um, but from there we go with, you know, we can evaluate uh, how much they're learning, uh, what their sort of um, awareness level is of climate uh, issues and climate actions around things like energy and uh, landscape and uh, transportation, this kind of thing. Um, and as we, as we move forward, then we want to sort of uh, assess and document the different kinds of climate action plans that move forward, the kind of projects that get planned. So we usually evaluate the action plans themselves. Um, against uh, you know which aspects of climate policy and are, are being addressed here or climate issues are being addressed um, and then lastly we hope to see some early examples of things actually changing on the ground um, it, it's pretty ambitious to try and get that uh, you know at the end of six months but we do think that there are uh, certain things we've certainly had examples from our coolhood champs program in vancouver uh, where people were you know, out there planting trees and uh, changing some of the uh, landscape practices, growing vegetable gardens, things like that, um, in a pretty short time period. So um, important that we signpost those kinds of things and then build from there, I think. Thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. Uh, anything else, Dr. Nick? Nope, that'll do it. Thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councilor Green. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to Dr. Shepard, thank you very much for the presentation, Dr. Shepard, and for being on site with us again. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, I, I know that local governments generally have found community engagement through the pandemic a, a huge challenge, and I'm not 
um, sure that the pandemic will end, um, at, you know, anytime soon. I think we're all hoping it will, but I'm just wondering how you've adapted your um, community engagement piece. This follows on on Councillor Appleton's uh, questions, but how you've adapted or how you will adapt your model for community engagement to to deal with the challenges around pandemic. It's, it's very difficult to bring people together. And the second part of that question is, I'm assuming that you will reach out to um, community organizations such as the Community Association of Oak Bay and the North Henderson Residents Association, as well as identifying gathering places for residents such as the Monterey Center and our rec center and so on. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Green. Go ahead, Dr. Shepard. Um, yes, thank you for those uh, uh, questions. Um, these are, again, very important. Uh, the, on the issue of, of responding to the ongoing COVID pandemic, um, we certainly have seen limitations and um, we'll obviously have to see how that, how that uh, evolves. What we've been able to do over the last uh, two, two and a half years um, is uh, conduct workshops in different formats. So some of those are, have been completely in person, some of them have been completely on, online. So for example, when we did uh, the second cohort of the Cool Hood Champs program, which also uses the Cool Kit, quite similar in many ways to this, um, but run exclusively through community centers. Um, we, we, the first one was largely in person, and the second one was completely online. And we were able, to, we found that uh, we, we got similar numbers, we got um, a lot of enthusiasm, and uh, people were um, actually bonding <laughs> on, online um, because we have these repeated workshops and they have homework in between, and so in some cases, uh, sharing, uh, sharing their projects. And, uh, uh, Elisa and, and uh, Sarah and others here have, have sort of seen that in a, in a variety, using a variety of media. Zoom is obviously a, a, a great channel as we're using now, and, and we've been able to do all of those exercises. Sometimes they have to go outside on their own to, to complete the outside activities, obviously. But it's certainly if we can do outdoor activities together, and that is remains permissible under the current as it is under the current situations that is also you know ideally the, the, the way we would go but it may be that we have to do hybrid and uh, um, programs and we've done those as well so i think we we, we know enough now to, to be able to handle it either way and uh, and still get meaningful outcomes from it on your second question um certainly uh, we think the the existing organizations offer so much uh, expertise and knowledge uh, of the community and of organizing um, and communicating that we really do want to, to tap into them and finding the exact form, whether that's a, some sort of steering group or, a, or a, uh, a different sort of forums that we can provide. There's a number of ways to do that, as I, as I said. Um, but I think it will be really important to tap those kinds of organizations and those kinds of existing centers and existing hubs because that's where you can pull in people who again aren't there only for climate action they're there because this would be a positive thing to be doing for the community um, and we have uh, as you probably saw in the maps we've certainly mapped um, uh, some of the more obvious hubs but others you know through this selection process or the application process rather uh, we may learn of other ones that we weren't fully aware of. Uh, some of the strongest ones are, are, are related to, you know, parks. The Uplands group is, is you know, obviously um, a very well-known group of volunteers, highly organized. And so they may be able to identify, you know, their own kind of hubs or their own kind of meeting locations. So I think we have to be open to what fits with the community. Thank you very much, Dr. Shepard, and, and certainly um, Mr. Heidley has great, great connections to volunteers in the community um, and works closely with them, so he's a great resource. And I think what I like about the Cool Kit is that it brings it down to the grassroots level. 
Um, I think many of us at times feel overwhelmed with this whole issue of climate change and, and disempowered almost in, in some ways. So I think this is gonna be very valuable on the ground and thank you very much again. Thank you, Councillor Green. Um, go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Thank you very much, Chair, and, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shepard, for the presentation. Uh, absolutely fantastic to see this program come to fruition. I've been following uh, uh, your and your organization's work uh, closely, and uh, I'm thrilled that we're here and looking forward to this rolling out and helping us uh, uh, re-engage. Um, this will be one of our, uh, I guess, one of our uh, 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 programs uh, that'll be firing up just as the pandemic is winding down. So thank you. Uh, the timing seems to be good. Um, I wanted to... Um, uh, briefly give a shout out uh, to staff to say thank you very much for another uh, partnership with a nonprofit or an organization associated with the university. Uh, in addition to this, of course, we, we've been looking at uh, the Green Shores program and also with our association through the Urban Deer program with the University of Victoria. So I, it's wonderful to see that we're using uh, lo relatively local resources. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And also thank you to staff for the ex expansion of the um, Kitchen Organic Waste Program that happened earlier on this year that will uh, allow us to put so much more into our yard and garden waste and ideally could be used as part of this program. So I'm um, very much looking forward to, uh, to all of this sort of coming together. Uh, my question for you, uh, Dr. Shepard, if I may, I understand this program has been customized for Oak Bay. Uh, I was wondering if you could just sort of uh, expand upon that a little bit and maybe give a, a flavor for what other, maybe nearby local authorities uh, are doing uh, also in this area. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead, Dr. Shepard. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so basically we've taken the structure of the, uh, the generic citizen school kit that we've been using uh, elsewhere, um, but uh, sort of converted it, I'd say maybe 75% of it is, is, is the same as the basic toolkit it's, it's been available for some time but we certainly wanted it to make it look and feel like Oak Bay um, so the imagery as well as the uh, specifics of the policies that have been developed by council and and again trying to find ways to tap into uh, the resources and the organizations that are listed in it for example that are available in and around Oak Bay to support champions or support any group that's trying to take climate action. Um, so it's something of a sort of a, a localized uh, resource that could lead people into, into other things that are only available locally or, or uh, some of which are very well known and some of which perhaps aren't. Um, it also uh, does try and speak to the kind of policy actions that, that arose out of uh, the work that the uh, the climate uh, action working group uh, developed and some of those uh, those recommendations um, and uh, I think it's it's also reflects the kind of issues that resonate in the community and uh, uh, Councillor May already mentioned the, the leaf blower issue as one example um, but we know with tree planting with uh, things like invasives removal uh, there, there's, there's obviously passion in the community and we want to not ignore that, that we want to build on that and, and try and uh, spread that across the neighborhoods that perhaps have been a little less involved in the past. Um, so I, I, th I think it's, it is an attempt to, to make it very uh, specific and, and at the same time comfortable and recognizable to, to local people that it's, you know, it's their community and it's 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 up to them to be a part of, of this process um i think that answers your question but you also, oh yes you also mentioned other other communities so we've had a uh, quite a bit of interest from uh, other communities like saanich victoria um central saanich as examples um in in the cool kit um i know that obviously that saanich itself uh, with um, One Earth and the One Planet Living process had some similarities, um, particularly on things like using carbon calculators. We've done the same thing. We always build that in and we're actually using the Saanich carbon calculator as, as the tool that people can use to measure their own 
carbon footprint, which is always an eye opener for, for the community. Um, so I think we, we, we want to, we, we sort of have an eye on what others are doing, but I think we're going a little further than that in terms of, of um, the sort of the grassroots aspect of it and the sort of the, the physical visual things that people can see that begin to help shift uh, behavior, shift cultures. Um, so I think they're very compatible in most cases with what um, groups have, have done elsewhere, but we think this process might, might be more strongly embedded in the community, perhaps. Thank you very much, Dr. Shepard. Uh, any other questions, for Dr. Shepard, at this point? Just, I have two very quick ones. Um, just for my clarification, the booklet that's being developed, will it be more widely available, if, i.e. if there's a school that's interested in saying having a stack of the booklets, even if it's the year before, we might get out to, to running a program there. Are, are, are we planning on creating a fairly large volume so or be able to scale it up if necessary? And I guess, and the other question I have is the, um, uh, is there any plan for a, a portal, I'm assuming on our website that would allow us to, uh, to capture some of the stories and, and data over time and things of that nature? Dr. Shepard? Yes. Uh, the, uh, to address um, uh, the first uh, question, we will ship. Um, the cool kit itself, uh, we hope will be widely available. And so we, we proposed that it be uh, made available as a PDF on, on the website uh, for um, uh, the District of Oak Bay. Um, and we would encourage obviously people to, to use it, download it as they see fit. We um, have not budgeted for a large, at least within the CALP budget, uh, a large production of paper copies. But I think uh, certainly people who attend the workshops would, would get a paper copy. Um, and uh, beyond that, I think it would be sort of up to the district, see how far, what, what, what the, uh, uh, what the demand is for paper copies versus digital copies. But, but because it is a do-it-yourself resource and there is lots of potential for these self-directed groups um, to be working on it even during year one, if they wish to, uh, we'd love to have it be widely available and just become a, a standard resource along with the other, other kinds of resources that are already available on your website. Um, and in terms of a portal, I think that's something that we um, should discuss further with with staff and with the communications staff in particular. Um, I, I, I think the the idea that has been discussed before of aggregating the data is important, um, and we can certainly do part of that by documenting what we what we've found from the pilot groups as well as perhaps some of these self directed groups if they're if they remain active uh, and, and make progress over the year. Um, but I think the idea of how to, how to then share that information and uh, make it very accessible and keep building on it um, is, is really a great, a great idea because it would, it would show this kind of cumulative change happening over the, over the, um, over the whole community. Um, but I think that that's something we probably need to talk a little bit more about, but there certainly would be data and information that could feed into such a portal coming from the process as we've conceived it now. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Shepard. Um, this is here just for our information and to receive it. So uh, before we get to a motion though, I'm just gonna see if there's any member of the public who wishes to speak. We had one member of the public joining us in person later because of distance requirements as in another room, I'm not sure if they wish to speak, uh, if we know that answer, but also if there's anybody online that's uh, indicated they wish to speak. Are there any members, uh, do we know if there's any members of the public who have indicated they wish to address council on this? Not seeing any. I guess as we're sitting here, I'll make one comment, uh, usually reserved to post uh, motions, but, uh, you know, for those watching and curious what this is, you heard some overview of the uh, sort of a community led community level uh, education and engagement process for uh, for climate action. Uh, the idea here is in addition to the big stuff that goes on. Uh, this is a way of getting there's 18,000 people in Oak Bay to get 18,000 small changes happening 
uh, at each and every household throughout it. But to accomplish that, this is a tool that can help educate and inform and, and give some guidance to some of that work. So uh, the cumulative effect model here is, uh, is the intent and I'm very excited about seeing this uh, moving forward. I, so I take it there's no members of the public who have indicated they wish to speak, okay. So back to this table then, uh, we can take both motions to refer receipt together and then any additional comments before we call it moved and seconded, thank you. Uh, any additional comments before we uh, before I call the question? I will then call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. That carries. Uh, Dr. Shepard and team and staff, uh, Mr. Heidley and, and others who have been working on this, thank you very much for all the work. I know there's more work to come as this is finalized and rolled out early in the new year, but I uh, just want to express our appreciation for all that's gone into this so far. Uh, so thank you for that. And um, moving on then to the next item on the agenda. Uh, up next, we have the, uh, I guess, invite Ms. Bayer, Director of Strategic Initiatives. Um, we have here a Provincial Urban Deer Cost Share Program grant application. And uh, we have uh, Councillor Appleton. You do need to recuse yourself on this item, I believe. Uh, Councillor Appleton, I will say, if you wish to depart for the evening, there's only a couple of the minor items after this. If you want to, you're, you're not required to stick around for the, for the balance, if you wish, because this may take us a while to get through. Oh. Thank you, Your Worship. Yes, I, I will recuse myself from the next item as it relates to a, a, a request for funds from the ministry, which is my employer. Uh, so, um, and I will appreciate. I will, uh, with your with your leave, I will uh, excuse myself for the remainder of the meeting and the remainder of the agenda items. Thank you, Your Worship. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Appleton. We're getting used to these new uh, new microphones. Enjoy your your slightly early evening and. Uh, and thank you for your attention on that. I had a, uh, a note I should have said something before I even introduced the item. So thank you. We'll wait for a moment until Councillor Appleton leaves, uh, and then we'll invite Ms. Bay to join us uh, to introduce this item on the agenda. Good evening. And with that, uh, I will now invite uh, Ms. Bay, our Director of Strategic Initiatives, to join us uh, in the meeting. I believe uh, Ms. Bay is joining us online, uh, and I will allow Ms. Bay to introduce uh, members of the Urban Wildlife Stewardship Society, who have been uh, so instrumental in helping us put together this program, and of course, the, the grant application that's in front of us this evening. Welcome, Ms. Bay. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, as was alluded to, I can provide a, a brief introduction to, to both the report and uh, the, the team involved uh, from uh, the Urban Wildlife Stewardship Society. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the purpose of the report that's before you tonight is to seek Council's authorization for staff to apply for a Provincial Deer Management Grant, uh, grant in 2022. I say for staff to apply, it's, it's really Urban Wildlife Stewardship Society that has uh, prepared the application uh, package, but uh, to submit the grant to the province, it, it must come from the District of Oak Bay. Um, the recommendation in the report is that the district apply for a research grant of $30,400, which would fund approximately half the cost of the program. If successful with the application, the district would continue its partnership with uh, UWSS and its volunteers to monitor how effective the vaccine that has been applied over the past two years is at controlling deer population growth. The report before you includes reports prepared by UWSS that convey the research findings to date. Um, those are also available on our, our website for, for, for public interest. Uh, I, part of the website that deals with deer management in addition to being part of this uh, council report. Um, in summary, if, if I could just briefly summarize those report findings, uh, the, the, there, there's a lot of detail there, obviously a lot of work uh, by both UWSS and volunteers have gone into this project. Um, so it, it seems a little disingenuous almost to, to summarize the report findings in, in the context of one sentence, but uh, I, I trust that UWSS will provide a little bit more uh, flesh on my, on my one, uh, one sentence synopsis, which is basically that 
um, UWSS has observed a 58% reduction in the total relative fawn abundance the year after IC was administered. And uh, I can uh, state that uh, Dr. Jason Fisher from UWSS is available to present uh, their research uh, to date and to provide the rationale for the approach that's proposed for 2022. Uh, and I uh, can also relay that uh, David Budd, the UWSS uh, Vice President, as well as Christy Kilpatrick are also both on the line uh, in case there's any questions that they can answer. Um, so with that, your worship, uh, with your indulgence, uh, uh, perhaps UWSS could be invited to, uh, to present, their, uh, present their research and, uh, and the grant application that's uh, before you for consideration tonight. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Bay. And I'm not so I'm not now not sure who I should be introducing. Uh, is it Mr. Bud, Ms. Kilpatrick, or Mr. Fisher? Uh, I'll let you choose uh, yourself. Uh, who is uh, speaking first? Um, ahead, I'll Ms. just Kilpatrick. hand this over to Dr. Fisher, and he will um, he will be doing a presentation for you at this time. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kilpatrick. Welcome, Mr. Doctor Dr. Fisher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Um, may I share my screen? Yes, that would be appropriate if you're presenting yeah, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Just a question to staff on this. My understanding is under the new system, as we share the screen here, it does stream as well to the, to the viewing public. Is that correct? So we're not no longer relying on them having access to the agenda. When, one definite plus of the new system. So thank you for that. Uh, so yeah, go ahead, you're, you're now sharing your screen with us. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, the president and vice president of UWSS invited me to provide a really brief synopsis of where we're at with the project right now, as opposed to a full presentation of the research findings. So this is going to be very short and very sweet. My understanding is that uh, if Council desires uh, a full presentation of all the results to date, then we could set that up at another time. So this is just a, a touchstone as to where we're at in the project, a little cast back or as to how we started the project and where we're going with it. Uh, should take about three minutes. Um, we all know that urban deer are a legacy of natural landscape and ongoing wildlife management decisions. So we've pushed predators out of, uh, of our urban landscapes and we've manicured those landscapes heavily. And the result of that is uh, plenty of urban deer. Uh, so we went into this as a research project with some central research questions. How many deer actually live in Oak Bay? So we could get a scientific handle on this. Uh, what habitats do they use so we could provide information for landscape management if Oak Bay desires. Um, and of course, the key question, can immunocontraception reduce the population of deer in Oak Bay? And so I'd like to talk a little bit about timelines and where we're at right now. So to recall casting back to 2016-27, the instruction from the government of British Columbia is that immunocontraception would be considered only as a research experiment. So they are not prepared, they weren't prepared at that time to operationalize it, nor are they prepared to operationalize it now. So as you might be aware, uh, Township of Squimalt has also started a parallel project um, and they were also told it would have to be done as a research experiment, not as uh, an operation. Uh, and actually just getting the permit for the research was like pulling teeth because BC, government BC says, we want to hear what is happening in Oak Bay definitively before we commit to allowing this to be operational more widely. So uh, in 2018, we started the research project in which we put 40 cameras across Oak Bay, uh, 39 fairly quickly. Um, and we collared 20 deer with satellite collars and did telemetry analysis. And based on that data, we found that there were between 72 and 128 deer in Oak Bay. And I've got 128 uh, underlined because we're pretty sure it was on the higher end of that, of that estimate. 
Uh, and we also learned a bunch of things about where deer go, which I'll talk about later. So in 2019, we started the immunocontraception uh, in earnest based on that estimate. So if there's 128, we'll, we'll call it say 120 deer in Oak Bay, and maybe at most three quarters of those are does, um, then uh, we would want to treat say three quarters of the population that landed us at uh, 60 deer does. Um, so that's that's what we treated in 2020. We found 46 of those original does. Uh, we figured there were probably I think 56, 54 or 56 still living, uh, based on our data. So we managed to booster 46 of those. So give them a you know contraception booster. Uh, also, 60 new does were identified and treated with immunocontraceptives. So some of those were does that we didn't get the year before. Um, a lot of those were yearlings. Uh, so they were too young to booster the year before, but had recruited into the population. And, uh, and then in 2021, so the past fall, uh, we just boosted 71 of uh, what we believe is 104 of those deer does um, that were originally treated, uh, so are, are boosted. Uh, and then 2021, we also started in earnest the data analysis, and I'm not going to go through the results of that. Again, that could be um, another presentation if council so desires. Uh, the reports are all on the web page, and so you have a pretty good idea of what we found, but what we are able to find so far is definitively identify some of the habitat factors that are leading to boosted deer populations in Oak Bay. Um, so if a council and citizenry decides to go that route, that's um, there could be some management recommendations pulled out of that research. Uh, and we also found that yes, immunocontraception does work in reducing uh, the relative abundance of fawns, um, a 60% decrease, which um, matches pretty well with what we think is the proportion of treated reproductive females in the population, which is probably around 60% based on, based on those numbers. So that matches up really nicely. But of course, the question before us was, can we reduce fawns? We were fairly confident we could reduce fawns with immunocontraception, provided the, the IC worked, and it did. Um, the real question here is, can we reduce the population of deer in Oak Bay? So to do that, uh, we have to monitor over the years. And so those cameras have been in place since 2018. Uh, we've been monitoring annually throughout that whole period. And what we're waiting for now is a population signal. To get that population signal, the old deer have to die off, right? So what we've done now is we've um, we've prevented new deer from coming into the population. Now we have to wait for the majority of the old deer to die away. And that's going to take a while. We always knew that it would. So this timeline is what we had originally proposed uh, back in 2018 when we started this project as a, as a multi-year research project. Um, we committed to monitor, um, providing IC and then monitoring for three years afterwards. So 2019 through to 2022 um, and hopefully plus. And so what we've proposed now for 2022 is to hit the data analysis uh, in earnest. So what we have to do is to estimate population size for each of the years um, to augment that initial population size estimate we got in 2018. So track it in 19, 20, 21, and 22. So look at that, look for that population signal, and also look for some evidence that the demographic is shifting because we expect to see um, not just reduced fawns, but um, a, um, a just a smaller number of deer overall, and maybe a change in the herd composition between males and females. Uh, and that requires a, a lot of work. And so while, um, yeah, so, so while, while that work is, is ongoing, it's absolutely required because that's the only way that BC government so far is going to operationalize IC in Oak Bay or Esquimalt or any other jurisdiction in the provinces. Once they are convinced that there is a population signal from you know, contraception and that the population can be reduced effectively with uh, IC treatment and then the follow-up boostering that's required given the immunocontraceptive we use, 
Um, that's what's going to be needed going forward. And so we're at a really critical point here where we've done um, we've done a lot of the fun field work. You know, we've, we've laid hands on deer um, and we've been very, very successful. Uh, we did it very humanely. Um, this represents uh, thousands of volunteer hours. I haven't uh, economically evaluated that, but it's got to be up and, you know, approaching six figures uh, in the amount of time my volunteers spent on this project. So, so we've done the fun part. We've done the um, immunocontraceptive and treatment part, which is what we're really all here for, right, to get that job done. Um, and now it's really time to bring all that information home, which was the plan always from the start. Um, so the six main findings from the Oak Bay Deer Project so far is around the importance of data, right? And so we showed that the, the actual uh, data-based estimate of deer was radically lower than a lot of the anecdotal reports. Um, early estimates, talking to folks, results of surveys suggested anywhere from like 500 to 1,000 deer in Oak Bay. Now there's, there's a, probably around 120. Um, uh, the scientific methods we used are, are very, very well supported. And uh, in fact, that's currently um, looking to put that together for publication, right? Um, we found neighborhood pockets. So the population is definitely not distributed evenly throughout Oak Bay, that there are concentrations found in the uplands, golf courses, the near Oliver Brighton. And the analysis that you'll find in those reports is that um, one of the best predictors of deer occurrence is, is lot size. And they're, most of the deer by far are hanging around those great big, huge, really well watered, well manicured, well gardened lots. Um, and I think water is the key here, right? And so we did some analyses, which took a look at, you know, what's behind the large lot size besides just having a big smorg for deer. Water is the big one. Keep in mind, Oak Bay used to be a dry Gary Oak savanna, with, and Gary Oaks do not provide a lot of good food for deer. Um, we water that landscape heavily now, which provides for a lot of good wet forage, which is what deer are after. Um, and we found home ranges are very, very small, meaning that um, deer use very small sizes uh, of home ranges in, in Oak Bay. So most of the time when you see a deer walking by, it's probably the same deer you saw five minutes ago, just walking in a circle. Um, we found that 60% fawn reduction can be achieved after one year. Uh, and so keep in mind that uh, we committed to doing this for three years because the immunocontraception we use, um, PZP, required it. Um, so, uh, so, so far, we are going to follow up on the 2020-2021 uh, results of the boostering um, because it's that three-year period that uh, the PZP required. Uh, just as a side note, in a squy malt, uh, we're able to secure PZP22, which comes in a pelletized form, which slow releases over time. So uh, it uh, eliminates the need for boosters. So in that case, we're just we're just treating the deer once and then letting them go, uh, and then let them go into the population and seeing what that population signal is. It's uh, monstrously more expensive <laughs> to use PZP22. Um, but that's the course of action that uh, we opted to take in a squy mall. Uh, so, so we're right on track in terms of the timelines. Um, and as I said, in 2022 here is now when we're, we're hitting that data analysis. So that's the timeline and that's the basis behind the ask. And uh, uh, very happy to answer any specific questions uh, on the reports or anything around the timelines or the, uh, the ask in hand. And as I said before, uh, I'm happy to come back for a full like hour long presentation if you want to dig into the technical reports. But the point of this was to give just a really quick synopsis of why we're putting in for that um, grant request right now and where it sits. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Fisher. And uh, for that summary, I'm happy to take uh, questions from members of council. Um, maybe just, I might just start the question with a very big one. If, are we clear about what the province uh, has, have they stated what what they would require to say yes to an operationalized approach with using an immunocontraception? I, I mean, I can speak to that because I had to uh, use extensive powers of persuasion to get the province to allow us to replicate the study in the squibble. 
Uh, they did not want to let us do it. They um, were still uh, very intent on seeing a population reduction in Oak Bay before they allowed any more of these shenanigans to occur. Uh, how I was able to convince the province to let us have that research permit was I, I showed them that we needed to understand the role of immigration in reducing the population signal, right? So when you create a population void, other deer are expected to come in and use that void and fill that void. Nature abhors the vacuum and Oak Bay provides a great smorgasbord, right? Oak Bay is connected to Victoria, it's connected to Saanich. Saanich especially is a, is a big problem given the number of deer that are hanging around here. Um, and so right from the get-go, we understood we were trying to see this population reduction based on IC and then see how long that would last before it gets filled up from emigration from surrounding neighborhoods. A squimal, of course, is surrounded almost entirely by water with the exception of the bit abutting uh, Vic West and of course the Isthmus. Uh, and so it provides a completely different landscape. We would expect much less immigration from outside of that. Anything coming into that area is gonna have to come down from View Royal through that Isthmus. Um, and so we expect that population signal to remain a lot longer because of that uh, lack of immigration. And so I convinced them that we needed these two study landscapes to compare off one another so we could have a better understanding of how long we can expect this treatment to actually last before we have to dive back in and cycle it back up again. Um, and that was, that I said, that took a lot of convincing to do. So um, I don't know if you have received any direction specifically about what the province requires before they'll operationalize. All of the signal that I have gotten is we want to see a clear sustained reduction in populations before we'll operationalize. Thank you very much for that. I have Councillor Ney and the further hands as we go forward, and Councillor Green, then Councillor Patterson. Go ahead, Councillor Ney. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you really um, to staff for um, uh, supporting this partnership with UWSS. And I thank you to the, it's a remarkable amount of work that has, uh, taken place here and um, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see where where things what that I mean that was a very technical report that you've provided I, I can understand why you need that um, it was beyond what I was able to put together but the essence of the um, the finding that Ms. Bay provided for us uh, the 60% reduction is very encouraging uh, and I will be very interested to see what happens over the next year as you follow up on the research part of this. I, I just, uh, I have a, a couple questions. One um, to staff. I just wanted to understand where we are with this. I, I, I had understood that we had committed to this project to the place where um, we could get enough findings that uh, could be uh, considered by the province to operationalize the IC program. So yeah, I, is this just, uh, this is an update for us, I presume to staff. I mean, I know council needs to authorize the uh, expenditure, but, but it's, it's uh, this is to staff. Are we, through you, Mayor, um, are we just trying to um, uh, authorize the expenditure that we have already committed to around this pro program, or are we just doing this piece by piece annually. I, I had understood this was a, a, a complete program. So I just want some clarification, if I may. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ney. Uh, there's two aspects here. One is our funding, the other is the provincial funding, and then there, I guess three, and then the what is our endpoint of, the, of this program. Uh, Ms. Bay, perhaps you can talk to the actual commitments that we've made uh, in our financial planning and, uh, and perhaps attached to this project. And thank you, Your Worship. So the, the commitments to this point uh, have been from year to year on the part of council. Uh, each year for the for the past five years, there's there's been a, an opportunity to proceed with the following year's work. Um, the grant um, process does require a council resolution uh, this year as it has in past years. 
Um, so that's the purpose of the, the report before you tonight is to, uh, to seek um, uh, council's direction on whether to apply for a grant. Uh, there is an expectation that the district provide uh, funding to support these programs as well. So it's not entirely uh, funded by the, by the province. Uh, we are asking for for somewhat more than than what the province has set out as as their as their usual uh, their their expectations is set up under the uh, under the grant program is that up to twenty thousand dollars is is what we can ask for. So we are asking for uh, a little bit more than that. Um, we've done that successfully in the past, so we're taking the same approach uh, the, the same approach this year. Um, so it's really up to council uh, how you wish to proceed uh, with this project. Um, I have asked the province as to whether they are yet at the point uh, where they are prepared to, to operationalize the program. Uh, and I have not got a response saying that they are. Um, the, I, I will point out that the, uh, the, the grant program has uh, uh, two streams associated with it, a, a research stream as well as an operational stream. And uh, immunocontraception is, as uh, Dr. Fisher uh, stated, not currently accepted as uh, something that it can be funded under the, um, under the operational program. So I think that's in, in essence the answer. As much as I have not got a clear uh, response yet on what it would take for the province to be prepared to uh, to operationalize immunocontraception. Uh, Dr. Fisher is probably more in the loop on on where those discussions are are, are at than, uh, than, uh, than 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 I than I am. Um, but in response to, to, to the question, really, council's in full control of, of each and every year. Uh, you'll recall that uh, as part of council priority discussions uh, on November 22nd, uh, council did provide direction to staff to um, place in the budget some funding uh, on an ongoing basis to support uh, potential future operationalization of the uh, of the program uh, should the should the province uh, allow for for ongoing immunocontraception, um, but that uh, that decision is yet to be made. The, the extent of council's uh, direction on November twenty second was that staff include it in the in the budget that uh, is coming forward early in the new year. So council has not actually approved that money yet. Uh, if council accepts uh, the uh, the staff recommendations in in the report tonight, um, then that would commit um, the district's share of the funding so that we could match uh, this uh, the, the grant commitments under this program if we were to be successful with the application. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, through you, may question if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm very aware I, because I've been in this uh, on the previous council when we began this program, and uh, uh, I still recall how divisive this whole issue was and, and how much. Um, uh, uh, polarization existed in our community around uh, how to manage the deer herd. And uh, I, I personally find that um, there is a question here, Mr. Ware, Mayor, just bear with me, but, but how much more, um, you know, the attitude of our community is, is, is one of how do we, how we live with uh, this deer population. It, it, it's a very different relationship our community generally has. And I, I really want to thank UWSS for that because I know that beyond this program, there's been a lot of um, a troubleshooting with the community, taking uh, questions and, and, and uh, uh, following up on deer conflict with our, with our community and educating our community. So I, I, you know, Oak Bay has got a huge amount of value out of this project. And I, and I do feel positive that we are going to move towards um, this being operationalized by the province. Of course, that's out of our hands, but I just want one more question, Mr. Fisher, or Dr. Fisher. It's, I, the issue with Saanich, because a lot of the deer come across from Saanich, is, is that a concern for you uh, as you, move into this next stage of the research project um you know the deer coming in and replacing the, the deer that aren't 
fill in space. How are you managing that? We don't have a wall. There's no fans, you know, that sort of seamless uh, movement of the deer from one municipal, uh, the deer don't know where the municipal boundaries are, do they? So I'm just wondering how you, how you manage that. Well, it's not, there's no way to manage it. It's not mine to manage, it's mine to study, right? And so um, what we, one of the things that we'll be doing as we monitor this deer population, we estimate the population of Oak Bay as a whole, that's part one. But the other thing we do is we take a look at the spatial signal uh, that we see in the cameras. So those cameras are arranged over Oak Bay going from north to south, from Saanich down to the water, right? And so if we do see an infiltration of deer um, through time, once we see a population reduction from north to south, we'll catch that uh, on the cameras. Um, barring uh, actually catching deer in Saanich and marking them individually and seeing if they're moving into Oak Bay as the Oak Bay population reduces, that's the best we can do. The ideal thing would be if, um, Saanich came on board in a multi-region uh, approach to this work, like a Squimalt has done, so that we can extend this work into Saanich, uh, especially, and, and especially around understanding that immigration component of it. Uh, but so far, Saanich has not bitten at that apple. Okay, thanks. Not, not, nothing simple in the real world, but uh, thank you very much for, for that response. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thank you, Councillor Ney. I have my Councillor Patterson and Green and Zelta. <laughs> new, contr new controls. I have to sit forward here also. Um, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Fisher for the, the report, really interesting study. And I, I did try to um, go through a lot of the data. It is extremely um, technical and so certainly shows the expertise um, and the, the very qualified knowledge that is needed to actually put this together. And um, really delighted to hear that uh, you and all members of the team so effectively collaborated with volunteers, you know, four digits of volunteer hours is, is really um, amazing and tre tremendous value in learning for the, for the community. So congratulations on that. If I might ask uh, one question, uh, the referred to mortality rates, and um, I'm just wondering from the, the data that I read, it, it wasn't clear to me, but how um, how the how you capture within your data the mortality rates, both natural and non-natural, um, and uh, how you collaborate with perhaps other agencies to collect that data. Mr. Fisher. Dr. Fisher. Oh, sorry, I was mute. Classic. I've only been doing this for two years. You think I'd figure that out? Um, I might ask Sandra Frey, uh, who wrote the report, to jump in on this um, because I don't actually have it in front of me. What what part of the mortality rate are you referring to? Just to orient me here. Yeah, and it wasn't specifically. Uh, it, it it just talked a bit about mortality, but when you were when you were giving your um, uh, your background on this, you talked about reductions in the, the number of deer in, in Oak Bay. You also talked about reductions in the herd going forward um, based on natural mortality of the deer. Oh, I see. Yeah, most of us realize that there are, there, you know, there are natural and non-natural mortality rates. And so it's not specifically referenced in the study. And my question is, uh, is that data captured and how is that captured? Is it a collaborative effort with other agencies to provide a fulsome look at uh, the data? So we, um, we have to infer mortality rate based on the drop in population size. So the, the only thing that we are uh, able to track on the cameras is how many deer are left. And so we might assume that 
some of those that don't appear between year year one and year two um, are dead. Maybe some of them moved off into Saanich or, or somewhere else. Um, and when I say natural mortality, um, I'd consider in, in that case, I meant like including cars, uh, unfortunately, or other misadventures, basically mortality that we as scientists or we as Oak Bay uh, Council are not inducing, i.e. from a call, right? So, um, so that's the terminology that we use in the report. So we're waiting for those deer to, to die off as they are going to die off, whether we are here um, studying them or not. And then we look to see how that population reduces um, subsequently. There's no good way to track uh, mortalities unless you have collars, satellite collars on all of your deer. And so when that deer goes down, that satellite collar sends a signal um, and then informs us on our phones, the deer is down. And so we know right away. And so we were able to get a sense of our collared population, our 20 collared deer, about what that mortality rate was. And it's slipping my mind right now. Do you happen to remember, Sandra, how many we lost when we had deers collared? Was it like four of 20? Not off the top of my head, but yes, I think in the early year of the study, when all of the cameras, sorry, when all of the collars were still fully operational and signaling to us, um, we had, I believe, four mortalities within that first year. None of them were collar induced. Some of them were related to car injuries or disease, but we did see what we thought was higher mortality than we maybe had expected um, just based on our observations of car mortality and disease. Um, thanks, Sandra. I mean, that being said, 20% adult mortality per year is kind of what you'd expect out of uh, a deer population. Uh, and so if we were to model these data, you know, we, if we saw a 20% reduction over the next, you know, per year over the next three years, that compounds. Um, so we would expect to see, if, if there's no new deer coming into the population, we would expect to see, um, you know, a 20, then 40 then 60% reduction, but how that actually plays out, we don't know. But with those expensive collars are the only way to get that information uh, because um, a lot of deer, you know, there's when deer are found dead, uh, citizens report them in and then so that of course goes to public works and that's reported. Um, if there's a vehicle collision, the animals gets killed, that goes to landfill, that gets reported. But uh, in truth, that's probably a very small component of the deer. You know, we we find it's not uncommon for us to find deer carcasses just hiding out in bushes or in green spaces or whatever that have died and crawl off into a bush. There's a lot of mortalities that go unrecorded. And so um, without really good records, there's no good way to record that. Um, but we can record how many deer are left. And that's what we're up to. Thank, thank you very much for that information. Just uh, one more question uh, that I, I didn't see anywhere in the report. Uh, and uh, I've had the question asked to me and I didn't have an answer. So I'm coming going to the experts now. Um, what impact, if any, does the contraceptive have on soil and plants uh, as it goes through the deer system? Dr. Fisher? Uh, there is no impact. So the only thing that you know contraceptive does is that uh, basically, well, let me put this as non-technically as possible. The only thing it does is that it, it makes it so that the deer cannot get pregnant. Um, and uh, it does not pass through their system. It does not go into soil. Does, therefore, it does not go into plants. It's not, a, um, it's not a chemical. It's not a pollutant. So it doesn't bioconcentrate. It's, um, it's just a, um, an immuno agent that makes the deer react in such a way that the deer, the, uh, the old can't be fertilized. So there is, there is no um, excreting of this substance. It doesn't work that way. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Hey, Councilor Patterson. And sorry, my apologies. I keep uh, trying to hit the button in anticipation and it cuts off the other speakers when I do that. So I will uh, try and uh, manage my finger a little more judiciously. I have Councillor Green and Zelka and uh, I'm assuming Councillor Braithwaite would like to speak as well. So uh, go ahead to questions, uh, Councillor Green. Thank you very much, Mayor. And, and first of all, a great deal of thanks to, to Dr. Fisher, to 
uh, Christy Kilpatrick, to the volunteers, to the scientists involved in this project. Um, I, I, you know, I think the volunteer hours alone and the commitment um, are uh, a huge signal to the community that this has been a very worthwhile project. I have always believed that, and I agree with Dr. Fisher, that without a regionally coordinated program, ultimately, um, with other municipalities, especially Saanich involved, um, that urban deer are something that we're going to have to contend with one way or the other and, and learn to coexist and live with. Um, Dr. Fisher, I, my only question is, when the province um, indicates a sustained reduction, do you have, can you indicate what they mean in terms of timelines? Um, over what period of time do they look at that before they will authorize operationalizing the immunocontraception? Thank you. Dr. Fisher. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that's a fantastic question. I have no idea. Um, that has not been conveyed to me. I put that question to uh, Shelley Marshall, who's the uh, regional biologist for the province, uh, sorry, pardon me, for Vancouver Island region and the one who authorizes the work permit. Um, and I think the, the short answer is the government doesn't know, I think. And so this, that would be a very good piece of information to get out of the advisory council, the provincial advisory council is, what is their benchmark for operationalization? Because currently they don't have one. Thank you. And, and really, what is their benchmark for success? Um, certainly on the face of it, Oak Bay has, this project has been very successful. I think a 60 to 65% reduction in known deer here is, is huge. Um, and I, you know, I think the best part of this project for the community is that you, by being involved with UWSS, we took this out of the political divisive um, context and we, and we transitioned it to the scientific context. So we anchored it in science. And I think that's the huge win for this community and obviously for others who are looking at this model and watching it carefully. So I think we owe you a huge debt of gratitude and thank you for everything, all of you and all of you associated. But I know that your leadership, Dr. Fisher, has been remarkable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Green. Councillor Zelka. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fisher, for the presentation and uh, uh, continuing thanks and appreciation for the Urban Wildlife Stewardship Society and all of the Oak Bay residents, um, many, many uh, retired and expert uh, 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 residents who came together to form that uh, nonprofit society and help to um, organize uh, on, a, on a humane and appropriate, what I feel, appropriate response after um, uh, the attempt at a call. Uh, so many years ago. Uh, I very much appreciate, uh, Dr. Fisher, you're, you're going through the history uh, of how we got here. Uh, when this program sort of first kicked off back in 2015, 2016, 2017, um, I sort of was under the impression that it was essentially a five-year program that we were, we were committing to based on what, what I heard the province saying, what I heard sort of coming to council, what I heard some of the, from some of the initial um, presentations that were put forward. And um, I guess uh, uh, I'll start with my first question. It'll, it'll actually be to the chair, if it, that's entirely possible, because I understand uh, our mayor is still a member, uh, which I would like to confirm, of the uh, PUDAC, the Provincial Urban Deer uh, Cost Share Program. And uh, assuming that's true? Yeah, I am a member of Provincial Urban Deer, which, uh, which adjudicates the uh, the applications. So I have to recuse myself, obviously, in the case of Oak Bay's application. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, for for um, for clarifying. And I very much uh, want to say thank you um, for uh, whatever part you're playing in the policy of this program, in terms of the flexibility being shown uh, to allow the research to move forward in ways that that paperwork and some um, bureaucratic policies don't always support. So thank you very much. I want to say uh, uh, in terms of being able to allow not only this program, but other research programs throughout the province. So uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's great. And uh, I do uh, I'm, I'm thrilled, not only uh, the fact that Oak Bay has been asked to be on this committee, but uh, the amount of 
of advertising and uh, and and news across the across Canada and across uh, frankly the world, uh, who are uh, there's obviously great interest in this. This isn't just an Oak Bay issue. This is a, a rather generalized um, uh, issue that uh, that seems to be affecting lots of others as well. So thank you so much for for all involved that actually got us here. Um, and uh, and again, thank you to the UWSS and all of the residents who basically uh, are, are exercising that expertise. And it's nice to see retired folks uh, don't just uh, give up and they actually keep pushing forward um, and give us a hand up with all this, uh, all this work. Um, the, 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 the piece that I wanted to ask about, um, you, you mentioned that one of the major findings is that there only appears to be approximately 120 deer in Oak Bay. And uh, I know that that's hard for some of us to believe, uh, at least as part of the, one, of the, one of the sort of initial uh, results of, of some of the uh, research and analysis. But recently I got a cat. And uh, I, 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 here's the analogy that, that, that I choose to, have to help me understand how this sort of phenomena occurs. This cat, no matter what room I'm in, this cat appears to be underfoot and is tripping me down, down the stairs, in the bedroom, bathroom, wherever I am, this cat is there. And uh, I get the feeling that the deer are acting a little bit like that. No matter where you go, there's always seems to be one either running around or just coming back to, uh, to say hello. Um, is, is that a first question for you, Dr. Fisher? Is that a fair analogy or is there some other mechanism uh, at play here? I think that's a fantastic analogy. Uh, yeah, that, that's exactly right. I mean, it was noted that the discourse in Obey has changed significantly uh, over the last few years. Uh, I think that's in part, in large part, because of the work that uh, Obey and UWSS in particular has done on uh, public education, public outreach. There's a lot of moving parts in here. Um, I think in part, that might be due to the fact that so many of our deer now have individual collars on, right? They have, they're collared, you can see, oh, that's, that's red collar, that's blue collar. Um, and so I think previous to this study, when you'd see a deer walking through the yard and then another deer and then another deer, another deer, you think there was four deer. Um, but now you see blue collar walking through your yard four times. You think, oh, wow, that thing's really hanging around. Well, that's certainly the feedback that I've gotten when we've been out and talking with landowners. Um, I think so perceptions have really shifted that these deer are just radically underfoot following from, from room to room. And, and that's a... And that's certainly what the science has shown, the satellite collar data has shown, and that's also what uh, has informed that density estimate. So yeah, that's a perfect analogy. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for continuing. Um, so I do uh, um, want to remind uh, uh, folks, I, I am a deer hunter, um, and I am absolutely not in support of a deer cull. So I very much appreciate that uh, this program has come together uh, somewhat um, organically, somewhat uh, you know, I guess you could say grassroots led, and that uh, and that we we were able to um, to to assist the various players to to help uh, move this forward. And I'm so thrilled that the timing was right for the province to uh, to essentially provide a way, uh, to hopefully to an operationalizing aspect of this program. So um, uh, I I appreciate also Councillor uh, Nay for providing a little bit of prehistory of this program and the um, the. Uh, aspects of how the, the community was frankly being torn apart, in my humble opinion. Uh, I just wanted to remind, especially the new staff who may not, have, may, may not be aware, new, new Oak Bay staff, there was, a, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a riot, but there was a, a march on the mayor's house for those who were ab adamantly opposed to the call as it was moving forward. And it really felt for a period of time like this, this uh, municipal hall was, uh, I wouldn't say under siege, but it certainly did not feel safe. So thank you again very much, uh, uh, Councillor Nay, for, for that uh, historical review um, of maybe the only other, I guess, uh, currently provincially um, mandated um, a tool that we would have to most likely fall back on if this program was not in place. Um, the last point I'll, I'll make, if I may, Chair, is... Um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming this thing that comes forward once a year is really just a pro forma. Um, I, I, I signed up for this program five years ago, so I know we're on a yearly budget cycle, and I know we have procedures and bylaws that we have to follow, but frankly, once I committed five years ago, in for a penny, in for a pound. So again, thank you so much uh, um, to, uh, to all of the players and to the fact that this research is actually going to uh, um, assist more than just Oak Bay moving out there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor.
I would just, uh, and thank you for the comments. I, I would like to, as much as we can, deal with questions now. And once we have a motion on the table, we'll deal with comments so that we've, I think, had probably had most of the comments at this point already. Uh, but just the interest in moving this along. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, Mayor. And, um, and I re reiterate um, some of the comments that my fellow councillors has made. It's a great report. Um, it's wonderful to get some of this data. Um, I did read it with interest, uh, especially um, that there's a, been a 58% reduction in the fawns. And I'm wondering if we know, um, if we have an idea of how many fawns we actually have um, based on, because I couldn't, I don't think I could find it anywhere in the report, but do we, um, do we know about how many fawns we have right now? Dr. Fisher? Uh, no, we don't. So we're currently working on estimating uh, actual numbers of deer as opposed to the relative drop in them. Uh, but we're doing that for adults because it's the adults that we have marked and, uh, and it's those marked individuals that, uh, and the repeat occurrence of the marked individuals on the cameras that allow us to estimate how many deer there are. So what we can do is um, estimate fawning rates um, per individual for known individuals. We see calf at heel, that's kind of a tricky thing to do, but we can estimate that and then times that by the, the known females in the population, but more directly we're estimating the, uh, the adult population. Uh, and that information is, that, that analysis is still forthcoming. It's the most complex and difficult piece. And that's largely what we have on the roster for 2022. I think it's fair to say, yeah, Sandra. I will, will qualify all this and say that, uh, although I might be the principal investigator on this, that it's uh, Sandra Frey who's uh, here tonight that um, has done the lion's share of the actual operations work. She's the project manager. She's pulled it all together and I'm just a tall gray haired guy that got in to speak. So um, thank you, Sandra, for all the work that you've done. But you have anything to add to that comment, Sandra? Nope, that was correct, Jason. Um, we didn't have callers on fawns, so we're not gonna be able to get a precise estimate for the number of fawns, but we are looking at the relative abundance of them on cameras and how that's reducing over time. So I think that's all we can say about that. Yeah, nor would we be allowed to do that. The province wouldn't let us do that. Funds are far too uh, vulnerable and weak and susceptible to uh, to take the, the the anesthetic from the dart projector uh, that we would need to deliver in order to get them in hand and then to mark them. So that's why um, even outside of urban areas, people don't estimate funds. Um, I'm working on moose research right now with the province that's all geared towards moose calves. And we can't estimate how many calves there are because we can't catch them and mark them without them dying. And so we, we all of us have to do this roundabout way of, of estimating, which is why it takes time. So, so no deer bling for the fawns. Correct. Um, so actually, I, I think Councillor Zelka actually mentioned that um, there's about 120 deer in Oak Bay, but that's not, I don't think that's what I heard you say in the beginning. I think what I heard you say that we were on the high end of 128 and that we had inoculated 60 deer in the first year and then another 60 in the second year. And that was only the females. So I would assume that even with a one third increase, um, a one third of that of 120 would be about another 40 um, deer that would be males. So I'm guessing that it would have been a little bit higher than that. So not the 120. Um, but it does go um, to um, the whole fawn thing goes into something that I read in the report as well. And just out of interest, um, it said that um, on page 12 of the report, it said that you uh, that you you re you classified the fawns um, based solely on the spots on their coats. But then you realize that that perhaps was not the correct way to, to classify them. So there was a misclassification. So I'm wondering how that affected the data that you collected or if it did. Yeah, so that's why we really de-emphasize that, um, that year one to two comparison because we're gonna go back and redo the image tagging for 2018 um, so that we can follow consistent protocols across. Uh, we're being to do too judicious uh, the first time around. We have since realized that there's a component to that fawn population that we had missed. And so it's really, it's that 
the, the other two years, um, that uh, the 1920 uh, comparison that um, we focused on in that report, and that's that 60% fond reduction. So, um, so we do need to go back and redo that analysis. Um, we are very, very confident in that 60% reduction from the year two to three. It's that first year where we got to go back and redo things. As for your first commentary, um, I'm, we're very confident, you know, st statistically speaking, 95% confident to be accurate that in August of 2018, there were between 72 and 128 deer in Oak Bay. Uh, and probably on the high end of that, probably 128. Um, but come fall time, there's a thing called the, the, the fall shuffle where animals are running around and starting to look for other animals to mate with and they move around all over the place, they move around a lot. Uh, and so because Oak Bay is so highly connected to Saanich um, and then and to Victoria, there's deer that are moving in and out of there. And so what we think um, is happening is that in the period between August and then September, October, there's, we think there's actually probably a flush of deer into Oak Bay. Uh, certainly when we went out to um, I see uh, deer in the second year, uh, there was a whole pile of them up and around Gonzales, et cetera, uh, Gonzales Hill that were like, where did these things came from? <laughs> come from? These were never here before. Where's these 20 deer? Um, probably just wandered over the border. And, um, you know, we saw some of the same thing coming in from Saanich. Uh, and so I think that's why we um, were able to, and, and certainly where we found those extra deer jives exactly with that hypothesis. Uh, and so that's why we're able to IC so many because we IC it at a time, I think, when deer had moved into Oak Bay to come and do their mating thing and then move on again. So that's why going forward, we're, we're gonna concentrate all our uh, density estimates on that um, September period, uh, as opposed to August, because we think that's probably a better representation of the peak of the deer population, which we're attempting to catch. Thank you. and. Uh uh, just, I have a, one other question around the um, the fawns because there was a comment in here that I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder what that means. And it says, um, it says that um, on page twenty one, it says uh, we're talking about the fawns, and it says that it's, this suggests the rates of twinning may have been reduced in black-tailed deer following the treatment with IC. So, does that mean that that deer didn't have twins anymore? They only had singles, or what does that exactly mean? Go ahead, Dr. Fisher. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly what that means. So uh, black-tailed deer can have triplets or twins or singles. Uh, in wild populations, you usually get singles. Twins are rare. Triples are incredibly rare. In urban settings, twins are much more common. You know, how many deer have you seen roaming around with a pair of fawns that heal? Probably quite a few, right? Um, and so what we observed in this data, it seems to be that even if deer give birth, they're given birth uh, post IC, they're given birth to one instead of uh, two. Uh, so, and we're still processing that the number of singles versus doubles, but certainly that's the signal from the data we're getting so far is that the IC treated deer, even if they do have in that first year, right, where we knew that the efficacy was not going to be 100%, it was probably down around 70, um, that even if a deer does give birth, it's giving birth to the one instead of the two, which is a fawn reduction. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, you then I, you did make a comment. You said that um, for the population, um, the, the old deer have to die um, before you can really then start looking at the, the, the effect that the IC had on the population. I believe that's what you said. Um, and so how long, can you remind me how long a deer in this case would have to live? Is it seven to 10 years? Is it less than that? Is it more than that? Fisher? We um, frankly don't know. So uh, there's very poor information on the longevity of black-tailed deer uh, anywhere, um, including on Va Vancouver Island. And so even I, I must confess, I don't have a good sense of that. I don't think it's that long, to be honest. So what we do have is uh, age information from all the deer we have captured and, and handled so far, which is, um, as you can see from the numbers, quite a few, right? And in every animal that we catch, we put a glove on and we stick our thumb in its mouth 
<laughs> excuse me, and we feel the teeth. And the teeth are a very good indicator of how old that deer is. If they're quite sharp, it's obviously young. After they've eaten a lot of plant material, which is hard to chew, it uh, those teeth flatten out with time. They do so in a very regular way. Most of the deer we have found are two to three years old. We get the occasional four-year-old. Um, I don't think we found anything so far we've classified as a five-year-old. Um, I haven't dug into that age data, but based on the stuff that I have seen. So we're looking at a population of probably young deer, two, three, four, um, which makes sense, I think, because you've got we, the mortalities we have found um, are frankly mysterious. We're, we're not sure what the cause of death is, even though Adam of the Valley Veterinarian has done the necropsies. Um, um, a lot of them have died of uh, full stomach malnutrition, uh, which is uh, a, kind of a strange, mysterious thing that could be resulting in what, what kinds of plants they're eating. It could be um, chemically induced. It could be disease induced. There's a lot of different reasons that happens, but a lot of the mortalities we're getting are full stomach malnutrition. Um, and um, so it tells us that there's probably a lot of food for deer in Oak Bay, but it's probably junk food. I, I'm going out on a limb here. This is pure hypothesis. Um, but the point of this is we're not seeing a lot of deer living to ripe old ages in Oak Bay so far. And so I would expect that that population signal, we're going to see it fairly soon. That's my, my best educated guess. Sandra, do you have a different view than that? If I might invite that. No, I think you kind of summarized that there, Jason. Um, we don't have the exact age of how long deer are dying, but we are seeing that some of them do die from diseases and other natural processes as well as vehicle collision. So that's kind of what we can say about that right now. Thank you. Um, I have two, two more questions. The first one will go to staff, I think, and that is um, what happens if we don't receive the grant from the government? Ms. Bay? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if we don't receive the grant from the province, uh, <laughs> I guess council has two choices. Either council can decide not to proceed with the project or council can decide to fund the entirety of the project costs from the district's budget. Thank you. And then lastly, um, on the um, page 63, at the very bottom it, uh, in, in on the... Um, application. It talks about in 2022, um, what's going to happen in 2022. And it says that um, you're going to, you, you will not administer any IC vaccines in 2022, so that you can evaluate for any population rebound effects in 2023 to 2025. So I'm, I'm assuming from that, that that means that no IC will be done between now and 2025. Is that a correct statement? Dr. Fisher. I'm muted. Uh, do you want me to answer that, Christy, David, Sandra, or do you want to? I think it's, a, it's essentially a scientific question, I think. So if we could, you know, from a, if you're managing this project to get the answers, is that in that, in that statement, is that, is that, is that studying requiring no additional IC or can that longitudinal aspect continue as if we were able to operationalize the, uh, the application of immunocontraception? The, uh, so, I mean, I, I'll say I'm not managing the project. I'm just managing the science behind it. Um, these are decisions that we're making together, right? Uh, and so I think that's the best answer that I can give. Um, I, I, the, the reason that we did the three years uh, of IC is because we knew we didn't get them all the first year. We knew that there would be some coming in as uh, the yearlings aged in, and it's what the PZP uh, vaccine demanded, right? It said, you know, the, the literature suggested if you do it for a year, um, then you get uh, X efficiency of 70% or something like that. And then if you booster for a second one, it goes up and you booster for a third year, then you get 90%. And that's what we were shooting for is that 90% range. So that's why we chose to do the three years of IC. Um, and then I think collectively as a group, we decided we do the three years and then see what that population signal is in the following year or two years. Now, I think the question remains wide open as to um, at what point do we want to 
re-intervene and reapply the vaccine. And hopefully, I think my best answer is that that should be informed by the population signal that we receive. If we're not getting any population signal of a reduction, but we are getting a very clear signal of fawn reduction, that tells me that we're getting significant immigration coming in from Saanich. And then it becomes obviously a council decision as to whether you want to pay to IC treat Saanich's deer that are wandering into Obey, right? Uh, and uh, so I, I, will, I will say that I think the future is wide open, um, but it does need to be informed by actual population numbers, which that's what the next year plus is about. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fisher. Um, I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to seek uh, a motion at least to receive, and we can take any additional comments and we can move through this. We've been talking about this for an hour now. Uh, so I think, and we also have to have the public speak to, uh, to call in if anybody wishes to speak. So at this point, I'm going to invite uh, the public to raise your hand within the application or hit star nine if you're dialed into the, the call uh, and watching it online. There is a bit of a lag, so I'm giving this a uh, this now, if you hear this, please uh, hit star nine uh, listening or on the um, uh, within the, app, the Zoom application itself. Um, most of my questions have been answered here. I really appreciate the, the thoughtful and detailed uh, answers that have been given by uh, our members of UWSS and staff. Um, my one question, a uh, fairly short one, there are other options besides PZP. Would, do you, is there any scientific link between different immunocontraceptions, i.e. there's one-time use ones like Spavac, there's the pellet piece. Is, is the anticipation uh, that the effects are, are less dependent on the type of immunocontraception and more dependent upon the, uh, uh, the, the effect, or is this really tied to a single specific uh, type or brand of, of immunocontraception? Dr. Fisher? Thank you, Worship. That's a really good question. Um, with, without a side-by-side -side comparison of the different kinds of immunocontraception, uh, it's very difficult to answer that. Uh, and there's very little research literature done about the efficacy of different uh, kinds of immunocontraception. Um, you know, we went with PZP because it, the literature suggested it was the most uh, effective uh, and um, the best option of the lot. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna have some really good information coming from Squimold on PZP22 and if it, its efficacy. I think from a humane standpoint, the 22 is a really good way to go because instead of catching a deer three times, you only have to catch it once um, and administer that pellet. Uh, if it works as the literature says, then that that's and it's also far more cost effective from uh, from a labor standpoint. So. Um, I wish I could give you a better answer, uh, Mr. Mayor, but um, we're, we're, we're going on the best information we have and it's very, very sparse. No, fair enough. And I, I appreciate that's the reality of this. I'm, I'm going at this from the perspective of, I want to be advocating to the province to allow us to do this as an operational project and note, no offense to all the wonderful research being done, but uh, we're in this for the results, not the not the uh, not the research so much. So, in fact, it feels very much like you know I appreciate the province co-funding this, but it's a pro the province's deer and the province's study to get a province's policy change. Um, we'd like to see it moved into that operational phase, and so that's the nature of those questions. Is like, can we? How broad are, are our results applicable uh, as we make the ask? So I guess that's the, the last part of the only the other second question I have left is, um, is there any suggestions here? We've been doing this, this phase of studies and research um, uh, in terms of anything that we can do more to advocate uh, to the province uh, to allow us to move into that operational uh, phase of this in a way that I guess we can't damage the research that's being done, but we also want to move from the the research into the into the application phase of this project. Do you have any advice for us in terms of uh, that advocacy and, and and framing of that ask? I'm not sure who to ask on that. They may that maybe not will be a, a scientific question. Maybe I'll, if I might, with your indulgence, uh, I might take the first stab at that before uh, Christy and or David uh, chime in here. I think they. The hard answer is like, what options do they have? 
so the calls just don't work that well. Um, it's as you know, it's uh, they're it, not only they're very very divisive, uh, uh, and there's lots of controversy around the humaneness of it, but it's extremely difficult to lure a deer into a trap in an area where they've got lots and lots of other food to eat. I've been in that same position myself in other systems. So calls work really poorly. Um, the research that has just been published out of the Kimberly uh, translocation experiment has shown that translocation is an utter disaster. What are you left with? What are your options? <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, I think even though contraception is the only real option that we have in urban centers. Uh, and so in your role on the Food Act, I, I would really love to know and put a hard question to the government, what other options are you actually considering for operationalization, given that calls work terribly and so does translocation? That's a fair, fair comment, I guess. Uh, thank you for that. I don't see any other uh, hands up on that one. So I'll, I'll just move forward here. Um, I might just get a motion to receive first and then we can uh, take any public moved and seconded. Any discussion on the receipt of the reports? The hands were up before, so I'm assuming there's not none from the online speakers. So I'll call the question on that. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed. Thank you for that. Um, and before we get to any motions on the on the moving forward uh, in whatever form council sees fit, uh, I'm going to just check in. I see no uh, members of the public who have indicated a, a desire to speak online. Uh, I'm just going to look out to staff to confirm that that my, my, my screen is accurate here. Okay. So with that, I'm going to come back to this table. I have uh, Councillor Ney and Councillor Green. Mr. Mayor, I was just going to move forward on the... Um... The motions here as uh, you so do you want there's three more recommendations by staff do you want them separated or can we just do them as a as a as a cluster i think they're so closely related is there's no point in separating them let's do them as as the three together and we can i'll, I'll move them. staff net recommendations a second and seconded thank you anything else councillor name nope just muted oh. councillor green yes thank you mayor um just very quickly in response to um, your question around advocacy, um, if you feel, and, and this is for you, Mayor, if, if you feel you needed to um, disqualify because of a conflict on, on PUDAC, then how do we actually advocate for Mount Bay? How do we advocate for um, support from the province on the entire project, both the research and then ultimately operationalizing once the research is is um, is completed. That's my question. If if you feel you have to recuse, then how do we how do we manage that from a, a provincial point of view? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. So at the meeting, there was a general discussion on um, on the state of the union from the province and a chance to discuss uh, pieces with the province. Um, we've in the past just dealt with other applications first and 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 Oak Bay last, and I've just recused myself on that discussion related to Oak Bay. Um, so that's that's been the, essentially the process has been underway. I have a thought on this and I think uh, following these motions, if we, if we are gonna move forward, I think we can probably do a couple of, of, of supporting motions to uh, write a letter perhaps in, in accompanying with this from council, just uh, asking. So it would accompany the, the package as opposed to, to my speaking. Um, and indicating our desire to move this as quickly as possible into, a, into an operational status. Uh, and then probably also directing me to reach out to other mayors to see if we can get a joint letter written regionally to the province to make that same request that they consider an operational uh, use of, of immunocontraceptives or immunocontraceptive pilot regionally uh, to allow us to move forward uh, as, as advocacy. So that would be my, my suggestion on that if we, if we wanna do that advocacy piece of it. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. I, I also think it would be critical to include the UWSS in, in, in that advocacy then, or at least um, consult with UWSS and namely Dr. Fisher when the time comes, because it's clear that until the research is completed and, and the data is completed, it, it sounds like the province isn't going to act anyway. And so all of this, I, I think Oak, Oak Bay becomes the project model and and the determinant ultimately once the research is completed as to whether or not this will be operationalized. But I, I, I don't know if UWS will be involved in that aspect, but I do know that, that their 
their project and their research will be critical, I think, going forward. Thank you. I uh, Thank you, Councillor Green. I might just ask Dr. Fisher and put him on the spot since we have him in the meeting. Um, should we write a letter of advocacy to the province? Uh, I think this would be different than the one to the accompanying the, the application, which has all the technical details, details in it. But if there is a general uh, letter written on behalf of mayors in the region to ask the province, um, could we uh, rely on you or someone from UWSS just to proofread our request to make sure it doesn't misrepresent the facts and findings before we send it off? Uh, I, in a most cowardly fashion, I'm going to defer that question to uh, the UWSS executive because I'm I'm here at the Fair enough. at the service of the UWSS. Uh, if UWSS wants me to do that, I am certainly very happy to do that. But I'll I'll take my direction there if that's uh, if that's all right with you. Sure, Ms. Kilpatrick. I would just say that um, you know from our our standpoint, um, Dr. Fisher as the lead scientist and Sandra Frey as the project manager are really key to this. And um, and I think we would definitely look to them um, to be involved. I don't think there's anybody with um, a better handle on what all of the, the importance of the data, the importance of the research and bringing it to a, a positive conclusion. Um, so, you know, to, to Dr. Fisher's comments around the timeline, we know that we know that certain things have to happen in the next year plus, but there's a range there where there's room for conversation. So I think, um, you know, having Dr. Fisher involved um, at all points is really critical. Um, we're really happy to, to be there in a supporting role. Um, but we want to see, I mean, the, the, the mandate of the UWSS is to see IC research through right to completion into peer reviewed journals and um, so that it can be undertaken by other communities. And so seeing this through to the logical end is really important. And, um, and I, I think Dr. Fisher is key to that. So I would strongly recommend that, um, that you um, access his expertise and through, through, through us if necessary, um, for sure. I'm not sure if that answers your question. And if I could just state another. Yeah, welcome, Mr. Bud. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to second up uh, what um, Christy has just said, because I do think it's really important. We're a partner with Oak Bay, but as the Urban Wilderness Stewardship or sorry, Wildlife Stewardship Society, it is really important that we um, complete the study. That is what well, is important to us. So I think as a bo our board could discuss helping with the letter, but uh, as long as you the intention of it isn't to get this, uh, not complete the research and just get uh, approval as quickly as possible to be operational. It is the uh, society's um, um, sort of a mandate and vision that we complete this so that it, like Christy said, becomes something peer reviewed and can move forward so it's useful to other communities as well. Okay, noted that, that, that priority, thank you for that. Um, Council, sorry, I had Councilor Green. I don't have other speakers on the motion. I'll go ahead, Councilor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, again, I want to really thank the UWSS and the, and the volunteers for all the work they've done on that. I'm so happy with the 58% bond reduction. It's great. I'm really pleased with that. I'm sure everybody else in Oak Bay as well. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, however, I feel really strongly that the province has to take over the deer management in BC. It needs to be operationalized to be a more effective program, in my opinion, and I think that others have said that as well around this table. Um, I, I wonder if we didn't support this moving ahead, then I wonder if, this, if the province, knowing the data that we have already, um, if they would step in to continue the research, because otherwise they're most probably most happy to allow us to go on and do all of the work. I mean, why wouldn't they be? So I, as I have in the past, I, I can't support um, moving this forward. I, um, I, I truly think that we need to send a message to the province that they need to take this over. They need to manage their deer. Are Thank we you. allowed to speak to Sorry, is the UWSS allowed to respond to that in any way, or is that not appropriate? Well, at this point, we just have a motion live on the floor, so we're just uh, we're just going to deal with the motion here. So we're just at a discussion table at this table at this point, Mr. Bud. So at, at this point, no, we're just uh, we're, we have a motion live and we're debating that. Uh, are there other uh, comments? Okay, that's fine. So the motions are on the floor at this point. Um, 
guess I will I will speak to this. I uh, I fully agree with Councillor Braithwaite that uh, this is a province's responsibility, and I think we need to up our advocacy game now that we have some much more concrete data that in, that really uh, firmly indicates the success of this. That the province needs to start taking this this approach more seriously, needs to start funding it more seriously, and and needs to move it uh, into the operational uh, folder in, in maybe an incremental fashion, but in some way, shape or form. Um, I, I'm hesitant, I, I, I will support the motion uh, unless I hear some compelling arguments against just because I think we need to move this forward and I think we're better at the table having that argument than we are. Uh, I don't feel, my gut feel granted that the province would step in at this point if we if we stop. I think the province is looking to us to to complete this enough to the, to the point where they can't ignore it anymore. And I, I think we're almost at that point that we can start some of that advocacy work in a bit more forceful way. Um, so I'm, I'm supportive of the motion as it moves forward here. And I'm very, very, I didn't have a chance to speak more outside of questions earlier. Um, and I just wanna express my appreciation um, to everybody involved in this project so far. I know it's been uh, managed, uh, you know, in an incredibly uh, professional fashion. The the scientific methodology and documentation has been very effective at at uh, at creating the compelling narrative. Um, appreciate all of the work the staff does uh, to manage this project over many years uh, moving forward, and uh, and to all the volunteers that have been involved, and and frankly to all the homeowners who volunteered their yards uh, proactively to allow people to come into them uh, to allow this project to have the success it's had to date. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just uh, express my appreciation to all those involved and, and to all those who are attending in the meeting here tonight as well. Um, I have Councillor Ney as well wishes to speak again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, my, my comments really are in response to the last couple comments here. Uh, I, I fully support you, Mr. Mayor, that we do go forward uh, and be proactive around the advocacy of this project. Um, and I, I do understand, you know, the legislative framework around, uh, you know, animal management, deer management is with the province. But I, you know, the history of this is Oak Bay in partnership with our community, uh, Christopher Patrick and, and the bringing of UWSS working with their staff has taken a leadership position here. And uh, we, we talked about uh, this as a research project, the council of the day uh, committed to it. I, I do appreciate they can't fetter decisions of any future council, but in principle, there was a project to be had here and we committed. And to bail at this critical juncture would leave such a hole in this project that we wouldn't be able to recover from if we play roulette with a decision from the province. I, I think that, that and, and take a chance on um, them coming to the table on this. I, I don't see the risk of losing out what has been gained and all the work that has been gained is worth uh, at this point, we've got another year, maybe two, um, to, to demonstrate the results before we get it before the province to consider operationalizing the IC. So um, I support this uh, and I will end uh, as we originally committed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nay. Go ahead, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And thanks to uh, the comments from uh, UWSS and, and my colleagues. Also, thank you to staff for managing the project over these many years. I, I guess the metaphor I'm going to use is from real life, and that is the COVID-19 vaccine program. Uh, without the adequate research, without the time to research, without the ability to test that vaccine, none of us would have benefited from it um, because the research would not have been complete. And I think we can use the, uh, the you know, the DEER program urban deer management program as a, a similar example. If we don't complete the research, we will be unable to test the efficacy of, of the program and of IC in particular. And it is about efficacy and that's what the research will support. So I'm sure the province will not move ahead until we uh, as a project and we as a community um, through the UWSS and its tremendous work have proved to the province that this is an you know, the, 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 that this is an efficacious program. So I think that's the really important part. And I agree with Councillor Ney that, 
if if we stop the program now, um, none of that would probably come to pass and the province would probably not act without that research and without that data having been completed. So that's those are my comments and I will be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, I see, oh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I do appreciate certainly the Councillor Braithwaite's comments. Um, deer are the province's deer, so to speak, but nevertheless, the nuisance is, is to residents in this community. And I think where we started on this and, and Councillor Zelka uh, touched on that subject, in the first year of the program, if we had, if somebody had said, if we do this, we will reduce the population of the deer by 58%, we, we would have been saying, you know, we'll take this on definitely. We would have been thrilled uh, with the results as we should be with this. Um, but, and so, yes, it, it would be good to, that the, the province come up to the plate and, and operationalize this, but I think it would be really short-sighted to stop short of, of finishing the research so that we have a conclusion that uh, really demonstrates to the province conclusively that this is what is needed on the long-term going forward. And that um, it really sets an example because we are an example to other communities throughout North America. And so, uh, the value that we have had with the contribution of, of research work by, by all of these uh, experts in the, in the subject matter um, should not be, you know, should not be overlooked in any way. This has been a, it's been a tremendous program and it's nice to, to celebrate some successes once in a while. And, and I think that this is actually a, uh, um, a su success story for the community. So I support fully that we complete this research project. And uh, um, and I think we have many years to go after the province to operationalize it. But I, I do appreciate certainly our mayor um, making the recommendation that we provide letters of advocacy uh, so that we make sure that the province knows what we want to do in the for the long term and for the future of the district. All right, thank you. And, and if we want to do that, we'll just do a motion arising after this the motion is dealt with. Uh, Councilor Zelke, you wanted to add something? Um, I guess I can wait till the motion arising, but um, uh, regarding the, the comment about the letters, um, I've, I've, all my council colleagues have said some, such amazing things about uh, the incredible work we've done here. Uh, I appreciate the leadership shown by, uh, by council, uh, by I have the citizens that have come forward to create UWSS and uh, and the uh, academic uh, uh, the academic um, uh, the depth of, of of academic support. You know, basically uh, uh, here we are supporting science and 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 seeing how this uh, this process can work in a very humane way that is so socially acceptable with respect to our social contract. So thank you so much, and I very much appreciate uh, supporting this and see it through forward not only this year but in subsequent years. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. Any other discussion before I call the question? Don't see any. All those in favor and opposed? Councillor Braithwaite opposed. Uh, that motion carries. Is uh, I'm, If anybody wishes to make a motion arising, I have a suggestion for, for letters. And if you want to do that, I'm seeing nods. Um, and I apologize, these were sort of done in, in the room here, but I think. Uh, probably separately, one would be to write a letter accompanying the application indicating the district's desire. Uh, to move immunocontraception into an operational status without no timeline, maybe as soon as possible or whatever the wording people see fit. Okay. Um, so with, is the mover and a seconder in the room here? Thank you. Um, so that would just be draft a, a, a brief letter on behalf of council accompanying the application to that effect. Um, is there any other discussion on that? Go ahead, Councillor Braithwaite. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so uh, because it's going along with the application, um, because I'm not supporting the application, I feel like I have to vote against the letter going as well. So um, yeah, I, which I don't want to vote against the letter going, but because it's being attached to the application, 
I'm a little torn. It's uh, Tom Spreathwaite, it's up to you. I, I would read it this way. Um, we offer it as a body. So once we've had the debate and, and moved a, a, a portion forward, we're moving forward in a direction. I think it's all of our jobs then to continue to keep improving, even if you disagree with the body of it, to make it as positive an outcome as you possibly can. So I think you should look at it in that light um, as we, oh, Jesus. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, my concern about sending the letter with the application is that it it presupposes and is is premature um, about the end of the uh, research. So I'm thinking maybe the timing is off that we should wait until the research is completed and then um, begin the advocacy because I think I would agree with Councillor Braithwaite on this particular issue that attaching it to the application, I think could be perceived as a mixed message. And what we want to be sure about is that we complete the research phase of this project. Um, and then at that point, um, then I think we, we, you know, we begin the advocacy process. That's my take on it. And that seems to be what I'm hearing. Um, and maybe I'm uh, ext extrapolating information that isn't there, but I think UWS is probably wanting to complete the research before any sort of operational program is either approved or designed by, uh, by the province. And I think this research will inform whatever program is designed by the province. Without the research being completed, I don't think the province would be in a position to operationalize anything. So I think that's what the province is relying on is the outcome here. And then that will inform whatever operational program they develop going forward. That, that's my understanding. Please, experts in the room, correct me if I'm wrong. Thank you. We, had, we have a forum to do we have a forum to speak to that we were invited to or no um at this point we still have just a motion on the floor for council so i i, I think though i would just say to the uh to councillor green i i take your point on that uh there was nods from uws as well i'll take that as input uh, from across those that they do see the importance of completing that research um i don't so i think the way i would read this letter would be essentially to make clear to the province that we do want to see this moved into operations and, and hopefully they could then give some clarification as to what the end of research would look like in terms of what they would see as acceptable uh, and, uh, and you know, research that would guide that policy change. Um, I don't see this as in any way, and I will be careful to write it that way, uh, not, to, not to override that, that need for, for clear research but simply to advocate on the, on behalf of, of of the province that you know the research has a point right and the point is to allow us to get to an operational endpoint. Councilor Green, I don't know if that helps. I I hate to belabor this. I, I guess I disagree. I think the research has a point. The point is to inform whatever program is designed in the future by the province. That that would be the way I would look at it, and I guess that's why I'm thinking the letter is premature. Um, they won't know what to do until they get this data completed at the end of 2022 is my understanding. And because this is a model program and because we seem to be the leaders in the field, and I use that very loosely, we, uh, UWSS and its scientific team are leaders in the field. I think that the, you know, the, the province will look at it very seriously in terms of, of completed research to inform whatever they decide to do in operationally. So I, I don't mean to mince words or split hairs, but I'm, I'm trying to illustrate that I think a letter from us at this time is premature until the project and the research are complete. That's just my take on it, but I will defer to others. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Green. Well, I don't mean to speak out of order here, but we are your partners in this at UWSS. So we're getting a lot of kudos, a lot of accolades from the people who are speaking here, the councillors. Uh, you know, thank you so much, but let's keep in track that we are your partners here and we really do hope that you fulfill your commitments that you have with us as well. Thank you, Mr. Bud. I just want to keep this in order here, though. We are we are just addressing the question of a, of a letter and, and you know, if, if it moves forward, I'm sure in partnership with UWSS to draft that, uh, uh, if, it, if it moves forward, that would be the, the understanding that that would be done in, in partnership with UWSS. But we have a motion live on the floor here at this point. It's on the table for council for discussion. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Chair. And uh, I, you know, there's obviously a, a lot of uh, concern and uh, and lots of information and a lot of passion around this. This is a, a very important program to 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 many many in the district. Um, so I I um, if it wasn't this government in power, I might tend to agree with Councillor Green. Um, uh, but just knowing that uh, that with respect to the pandemic, with respect to the context, with respect to um, uh, also the fact that PUDAC only meets once every year or two, not very often. Uh, right now we have their attention uh, with this opportunity coming up for the application forms. So uh, having someone's attention uh, for an organization that tends to be moving faster than what I'm used to uh, from previous uh, governmental regimes, um, I, I, that's why I would be intended to be favor to, of course, carefully word uh, so that we don't uh, somehow affect the um, the application form, but but provide some sort of support to operationalizing it as quickly as science will allow. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zalka. These new these new microphones are going to be the death of me. I until they get used to it. Um, are there other discussion? Uh, any other questions on this? Okay, if not seeing it, I'm just, I got a, I think a text just came in from staff to, to, get, to raise my attention. Nope, that was from my daughter. Uh, so, uh, any other discussion on this, uh, on the motion? This is just to be to draft a letter. And I, I think hearing what I heard from here is that we do that in conjunction with a very simple letter in conjunction with staff and UWSS just asking for the province, nothing else to clarify their their, uh, their the requirements for operation, opera, operationalization of immune contraception. Um, I'm ready to, not seeing any other hand. Oh, Councillor Nay, did you wish to speak? Well, I, I don't really, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I think it's reasonable that we draft the reason, the carefully worded letter. I. I think it's reasonable on the part of the province for them to see that that we would want that information, that kind of commitment to this project. I'm, I'm not clear how it undermines the research, quite frankly. Um, maybe I've missed the point, but um, so I, I don't see any harm in a carefully worded uh, letter at this point uh, to get some information and start the the. Um, the expectation to just articulate the expectation of where this project is going ultimately once the science um, has you know the research has been uh, completed fully here so I, I i i'm i'm supportive of the the motion as it stands thank you councillor Ning. go ahead councillor patterson You said the you said the control panel. It's dangerous. <laughs> yes, thank you. And you know, I really do appreciate the comments. Um, and I, I you know, and I I understand um, the where they're coming from. I I do see this as um, as uh, uh, an ask at this time that the province be ready to consider in the future. So I see it as, you know, pending the outcome of the research on this uh, uh, on this study, that um, the district would be seeking to oper operationalize it. I think it also in sending the letter out and and stating that up front, um, it solidifies the um, our position that we we want the grant monies for this because we do realize and appreciate the importance of the study and getting the the results of the study will then lead to opera operationalize it so i you know i just look at it as as um uh just a an extra step in in getting support for the province to issue the grant to continue the funding through to the end of this research project. That's my interpretation of it and, and the intent by which I would be um, wanting to support the letter going in. Thank you very much, Councillor Patterson. I don't see other hands up on this. So the motion, oh, go ahead, Councillor Zalka, go ahead. 
I just, I, I guess I'm assuming, but I want to confirm that uh, UWSS would have a chance to review this letter and maybe have uh, input from uh, from Dr. Fisher. Just uh, is, would that be part of the um, intention here? I just wanted to confirm that because because that would be part of my intention. Thank you, Councillor Zelka. And I, the intention here would be to draft one and run it by UWSS to make sure that we're not uh, the wording, but doesn't contradict any of the work that they're undertaking. Thank you. Seeing any other hands up, I'm ready to call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Mm, not a, oh, Councillor Green opposed? Just confirming, Councillor Green, you are opposed? Just nod, it's fine, I can see you. Yeah. Well, I'm opposed based on the timing, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. So Councillor Green opposed, that motion carries. Um, there is a secondary piece of this, but I think uh, to, if, if people wish to direct me to work with other mayors to, to advocate for a, a regional a province to look at a regional approach to this. Um, that is, uh, it, it's a little early in some senses, but it's also, I think, uh, I think this might be a multi-year advocacy <laughs> process. <laughs> and so uh, if if that's the will of council, I would be happy to, uh, to, 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 to work with other mayors and, and see if we can come up with something. Uh, I think if nothing else, we could get to the table with the ministers uh, involved and at some point and actually have a have a discussion about the importance of this so um my preference would be to do it but i also i'll listen to the will of council on that if there's no motion i will move it move on go ahead Councilor zelka and i will so i, I hope uh, chair that you have a chance to throw together another motion because you were so good at the last one um, uh, but uh, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, advocacy early is, is is good. Any advocacy is is, is good advocacy, and um, and providing. I guess we've always been been intended to go at a at a at a regional sort of approach eventually. So starting sooner instead of later would definitely help. And and if that group was willing to send in a letter sooner instead of later, uh, that also wouldn't hurt um, in terms of them. Maybe they'd also need to be educated on the whole PUDAC process. Who knows? But uh, in terms of them not being maybe being aware of it, so. Uh, education, advocacy, um, however you could suggest a wording, uh, I would definitely support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Zelka. What I drafted here was that a motion would be to direct mayor, the mayor to invite regional mayors to write a joint letter to the province requesting support for a regional IC-based immunocontraception-based deer reduction program. So sort of general in nature, and again, would have to work with UWSS for appropriateness. Moved and seconded. Moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion on that? Go ahead, Councillor Green. Yes, just briefly. Um, thank you very much for that. And, and I, I think that's fine. And I think you've answered my question. My question was um, that UWSS should be involved in that approach as well. Um, when, when other mayors, or, or at least when you bring mayors together, there should be expertise, I think, there to help inform the discussion. But I totally agree that this should be, and I've always believed it should be regional. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Green. Any other discussion? See any, so have, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, that carries. Go ahead, Councillor Zelka. Um, I just wanted to have a possible uh, other motion potentially arising. Uh, if you wanted to see it, if, if there's a potential support for this, uh, is that at some point, I think it, uh, we've, we've had so many um, senior people in the province come and, and present to our council. I wonder uh, at some point, if, if not this year, then certainly next year, we have the, uh, the provincial veterinarian come in to, to present to our council to maybe give her perspective on maybe her insight on what the province is doing and her, her maybe her insight on what we're doing here and how, uh, um, how this potentially could, uh, we could facilitate them, they could facilitate, they, they facilitate our process. So I just wanted to sort of put that out there that I think it would be useful uh, at least sometime within the next year to invite the uh, provincial veterinarian to, to get her perspective. On, on what's happening with this. Okay, I'm just, in terms of a motion, what that would look like, I'm going to, uh, well, I think it's it's the timeline. Uh, yeah, the timeline is the, uh, is, is probably the, the issue on that one. Maybe we should, we can see what happens with the, with the ask from the mayors and see where that goes. And we can use that as an advocacy piece to see maybe we can have them address it more regionally as, as at the ministerial level. Oh, okay. No, I think that's I think it's a good point. 
Uh, and I'm just, oh, the question just from staff was, can the regional letter be sent after the, uh, the, the grant application? And the answer is definitely yes. That's not tied to it in any way, shape or form. I, I think we're just dealing with this as a, uh, as a uh, as a purely as a as a going forward piece to kind of keep keep the pressure on the province to to, to not let it not let it go away. Um, sorry, and I've lost track here. The motion is have I called the question on the motion? Okay, so we had just nothing else arising. Normally we would we would adjourn at this point, um, given that we are here in in support of the uh, uh, moving forward the grant application through uh, with partnership with UWSS. Mr. Bud, do you wish to have a final? Uh, Final word before we sign off here on this item. Yeah, and I and I really appreciate everybody's time. So I just want to. Uh, this is my first time sitting through a meeting with you folks. So you know we're going to go back and we're going to speak to our board and we're going to uh, tell them what happened here and how we're feeling. And I'm a little bit concerned um, of whether or not we've got a partner in good faith here to some degree uh, with Oak Bay because what I'm hearing and this is what I'm trying to ask and maybe uh, somebody can respond to me is. What I'm hearing is we really want to get this operational as quickly as possible. We just want to deal with the deer issue. And uh, I just hope that uh, the council itself understands, especially as we're talking about COVID and these other things, that there's a scientific study that needs to be done so that we can move forward and say that we have the science to move forward with this in confidence in the future. This will work because we have science, we've done the research. And to try to short circuit that and move more quickly just into, well, we've got our initial 60%, we can move forward with this. Uh, makes me wonder if uh, the Oak Bay Council is really interested in completing um, this. You, I, you you got muted there at the very end of it, but I think I'll yeah, just point. I, okay, I just, I just want to know if, if, if you folks really are uh, interested in completing this study or just getting to the operational side as quickly as possible, regardless of whether or not it's done. Because uh, we're going to be back here again in a year to deal with a budget. So we're just volunteering. Uh, that's fine. I think you raised the question of are we acting in good faith? And I just ask that you put yourself in the other side of that question. If someone on council had asked that question at UWSS, if you would have thought that would be an appropriate question to ask, it's not. We're operating here absolutely in good faith. We've been operating with you as a partner in this, openly, transparently, in public, moving this project forward. And I think okay. that, that kind of language is very, very dangerous to raise. We understand this is a scientific process. We understand it has to be completed. It does not mean that the ultimate uh, goals of UWSS and the district are automatically 100% aligned. We understand there is a research component to UWSS. Clearly, the mandate of a district or a municipality is not doing research on deer. Uh, this is well outside of our mandate. It does not mean, though, that we're not working in close partnership to see a successful conclusion. So the effort here, our, 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 our ultimate success criteria may be different than UWSS's, but it does not mean that our, our, our okay. goals are not very closely aligned on this matter. And I think if I might just ask that the language used in, in talking about this stuff is one of partnership and one of positive and how we move it forward together. Um, because I think that is, is frankly, it's not, it's not helpful. And I think it, it actually undermines the ability for us to work together as partners. So uh, if I'm just, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I, I apologize if I, after two hours and 40 minutes here, I apologize if I used language that might've been inappropriate, but uh, I just, uh, wanted it's to apologize. that. Um, moving on here, any other item on the, any other discussion before I call any of the motions arising? Not seeing any. I'm, uh, thank you very much to UWSS and to staff at this point, and uh, we'll move on to the next items on the agenda. So I don't, next we have just a rise and report on items. And again, I guess as we, as we move on to item number 5.3, I do want to emphasize this has been an enormously positive relationship with UWSS. Um, and we could not have been where we are today without all the work that was done. Uh, I just think we have to be very careful as we move forward to not, uh, not, not, not allow, uh, you know, questioning of more uh, motives or anything else to happen in this. And I know it can happen after a long meeting. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Butt, for the apology. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm excited to work with UWSS in years to come on this project. Item number 5.3, just have a rise and report from the closed meeting. Um, and so we just need a motion to rise and report, moved and seconded. 
Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? <laughs> and <laughs> no, this, uh, it's, Oh, yeah, thank you. I think Councilor Zalka was just expressing uh, how, how we, it's sort of unfortunate that, that we have this with FERCs. I will say there's a lot of good intention here of finding a, a positive use for that property going forward. And this is definitely not the end of the story there. Um, item number 5.4, we have the acting mayor rotation. Moved and seconded. I just have to point out, because if you look at this list, it looks oddly missing because uh, Councilor Breathway is not on the list. <laughs> Uh, so for anybody watching and wondering why Councillor Braithwaite is not on this list, when uh, this council was sworn in, uh, Councillor Braithwaite was uh, appointed as the acting mayor in that first November, December. And so, of course, we're not a calendar year, uh, so she's had uh, that sway at it. And, and I would like to express my appreciation because I think that uh, that that was done um, a willingness on her part to take that, uh, particularly as it was the first couple of months of a new council and it was important to have someone who'd been on council for a long time and had the ability to, to step in as needed any time to take that first role. So while not on this list, Councillor Braithwaite, I really appreciate the fact that uh, that you took that on. And uh, and of course, uh, uh, this is this is important work that gets done periodically as, as needed throughout the course of the year. Um, so we have the motion, any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, then opposed, that carries. And with that, we just have adjournment. Move seconded, all those in favor? Opposed, none opposed. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great evening and we will see you on Thursday. Thanks everybody, thank you. Um, just, just to comment on the sound, it cuts out quite a bit, Kevin. Just, I, I lose you periodically, so just, Okay, thank you. We are going to be monitoring this. This is the first time with the uh, with the audio yeah. system, so there may be a, a little bit of an issue there, or it might be me bumping buttons or something accident. No, it's having a little bit okay. of a cutout. So but this is unfortunately the live test of our, of our system. So yeah, thanks I, for that but feedback. I, but I will say the audio is really clear and and very um, it's it's good that way. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Good good night. <laughs>